just tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own and Brokenness and pain is all I know but I won't be shaken I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand We, of course, want to welcome you to Jersey, streaming live, and we're delighted that you're with us. And uh, we are confident of this one thing. God has got this. He is not surprised. I am day by day surprised, moment by moment surprised, and I've never been a part of life when it has done what it has done, and that is everything seems to be upside down right now. But God is our rock. He is forever faithful. I could not imagine trying to navigate these uncertain times without having the help and the hope of our God. He is forever faithful. Now, um, one of the things we do want to share with you is a little bit about the future. First of all, we want to make sure that uh, you understand that we are doing everything we can to make and uh, keep you well informed. 
And so one of the things we would really love for you to do is to help us to know how to better communicate. And so if, if possible, if you could let us know what platform uh, you are watching us stream live on, especially our Jersey family, uh, we would be grateful for that. You know, is it Instagram? Uh, is it our app? Is it, uh, is it uh, jerseychurch.tv? Um, or is it Facebook? So let us know. We would really appreciate letting us know what you're using to get this service. You would email us at email at jerseychurch.org. Email at jerseychurch.org. We'd be really grateful. Let us know, please. The other thing is uh, what's going to be happening in the future. Well, all we can tell you is God has his plan, and this is a time where he has just given us just a very limited scope of knowing what's going to be happening. So we are planning to stream live for at least the next two weeks. The, and, and what we, we are praying for is that God might uh, allow us to gather together at Easter. Now, we're not going to do that if it's not safe for us to do so. And we are making contingency plans. Now, the other thing that I want to give thanks to is the faithfulness of this church over the years that has prepared our church at Jersey uh, to navigate these times. Now, uh, I want to express gratitude for your faithfulness in giving and your generosity, and Jersey has been amazing. And so what we're asking is not for you uh, to do anything more than what you're doing currently, because for many of you, uh, this is a time of great challenge, but we are grateful if you can keep up your financial support of Jersey during this season. Uh, we are estimating that um, our, our income in terms of our offerings is going to be probably cut in half. Um, but, but please hear me. Uh, you have been faithful over the years, and so we're grateful for not having debt. And we are committed, uh, trusting God, uh, that no one on staff is going to lose their job or have their, their pay decreased. Uh, but if this is protracted, we, we of course, will, will have to change as the situation would maybe become even more difficult. But once again, we want you to know um, we are grateful for your faithfulness. Thank you for everything you have done. And also, church family, if you find yourself in need, please communicate with us. I have a funeral in just a few minutes that I'll be conducting, but when I thought about, you know, I don't normally preach in Central with a tie on, I said, no, wait a minute. I want the church to know the building may be closed, but the church is open, and we, we are still actively ministering and reaching out to our families. We want to do as good a job as possible. Now, as you, as you pray, uh, again, we want to in advance thank you for your generosity. Thank you, Jersey. Lord, you are a good God. We thank you for your provisions. Lord, you were preparing us for this day and we didn't know. And so thank you, God. And Father, we pray now that as uh, our family uh, of faith is dispersed into their homes, that God, you just bless them with a sense of our oneness, that we are together in this as one body in Christ, that this is not bigger than you, no virus is bigger than you, and that you are forever faithful to your children. And God, if we suffer, we never ever suffer alone. And that if you allow suffering in our lives, we know that the result of that suffering will be for your glory and the advancement of your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to be generous as we give. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. It's always been you 
It is well. 
proclaim your name this morning over our church, over the church, over the whole world, God, just as we're learning how to be together when we're not physically together and just learning how to hear your voice more, God, with, with everything kind of just going back to the basics. And so we pray this morning that you would just help us continue to learn, continue to learn how to maneuver in this situation, how to be the church in every situation, including this one, God. I pray that it would help connect us more to the early church and to the church through the generations, God, and, and what they've gone through. And that we just, we wouldn't be asleep during this time, that there would be something finally to just shake us awake, God. So it's in your name that we, that we come together, we gather from our homes to, to sing these songs and to learn from your word. Amen. Well, good morning. And welcome to all of you who have joined us online. I have to admit it's a little bit of a strange sight to look out and not being able to see any of you face to face. And so I'm doing my best to Picture some of you huddled around your online device and, and maybe it's just you and your cup of coffee or, or maybe it's you and your spouse or maybe you and the, the family have gathered around to worship together this morning. Now, I, I do hope that there's been at least a few of you that have showered and, and dressed appropriately for the event. Uh, but uh, with that said, I want to thank Pastor John for the opportunity to open up God's word with you and and the title of today's message is Navigating Unprecedented Times. Now certainly what we're going through right now isn't unprecedented in the history of the world, but it, these times are indeed unprecedented in our lifetime. It's hard to comprehend an aspect of our society that hasn't been impacted or affected in some way. And the ripple effects are only going to increase as we keep going. And given all this, I can only imagine how the coronavirus is affecting you personally. You may find yourself on one end of the continuum thinking that I am bound to determine not to change my way of life until I am absolutely forced to do so. And you may find yourself on the other end of the continuum going, I, I am, I could just go through so many different bouts with fear that I'm I'm gripped with it to the point that it's hard to focus on anything else. You may find yourself somewhere in between, and depending upon the day, the hour of the week, you could be vacillating between those two extremes. So when we find ourselves in uncharted waters, how do we move forward with everything that it seems like is coming against us? Well, thankfully, God has given us a passage of Scripture today that, that really provides a plan for navigating uncertain times and unprecedented times. So go ahead and open up your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 28. Also, I want to encourage you to grab something to take notes with. I really want to encourage all of you to keep your Bible open the whole time and, and jot as many things down as you feel led to do so and and the purpose of that is that God's word has an opportunity to speak to you not only today but potentially in the days to come as well to get you started I'll even give you the outline in advance while you're either writing or topping at the moment typing at the moment outline it goes as follows we're going to be talking about the unprecedented event we're going to be talking about the uninformed response we're going to be talking about the ultimate exchange and the unimaginable results. So the unprecedented event, the uninformed response, the ultimate exchange, and the unimaginable results. And while you're writing or typing, go ahead and jot down Mark 8 and Luke 9. These are two other accounts of today's passage that you can look up later to see some other helpful nuances as you compare the three accounts together. Well, now that you're all settled in, let's dive in together in Matthew 16 and begin reading the passage together, beginning in verse 21. 
From then on, Jesus began to point out to his disciples that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem and to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and scribes, be killed and raised the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh no, Lord, this will never happen to you. Jesus turned and told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You see, this was an unprecedented time for Jesus' disciples as well. After spending over two years with Christ, this was the first time that Jesus predicted what was going to come from him, for him just a few months down the road. And for further context, the passage we just read comes right before Jesus asks the disciples the most important question that could ever be asked. Back up with me to verse 13 where Jesus asks his disciples, who do the crowds say that he is? And the answers are all over the map. Well, Jesus, some people are saying that you're John the Baptist. There, there are others saying that you're Elijah or, or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. There's obviously a lot of confusion around who Jesus is during his time on earth. But I find that interesting because if you stop and think about it, have, have times really changed when it comes to confusion around who Jesus is. We live in a day and age that there's still plenty of confusion surrounding this man called Christ. Who knows, there may be some of you that listen to this message that aren't exactly sure who he is or, or what it means or looks like to, to trust in him and to follow him. And this is vital to grasp because this prepares us for the next question we see Jesus asking in verse 15, but who do you say that Jesus is? Please listen closely. This is the most important question you will be ever asked in your life. I realize that there could be tons of other questions that you could be focused on right now concerning the coronavirus and its potential impact on, on you and your family, but but my hope right now is that, that all of us collectively can take a brief time out from all the virus updates and all the news feeds to take a step back and, and to develop a plan on, on how do, are we going to navigate the days ahead. So I want you to hold on to this question. You may even want to write it down and keep it in front of you. Who do you say Jesus is? And we'll come back to this a bit later. On the text, we see Simon Peter is the first one to emphatically answer Jesus. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And I want to help us see is, is to immerse ourselves and, and try to put yourself in Peter's shoes, in the disciples' shoes. You see, they're immersed in a first century Jewish picture of the coming Messiah as a triumphant king. All they know to look forward to in the Messiah is someone that is going to come and, as an act of judgment and, and military triumph. And then all of a sudden, after your reply, Jesus begins describing this first point of the unprecedented event in all of human history. He points out that in the very near future, he must go to Jerusalem, he must suffer, he must be killed, and he will be raised from the dead three days later. Now still, still, 
put yourself in Peter's shoes. You're trying to wrap your mind around this. You, you, you say your confession, and you are listening to Jesus' reply. And, and I don't know about you, but if I'm standing there, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, these are completely unexpected circumstances. You know, we spent plenty of time with you, and we saw you uh, heal people and restore people. You've taught us so many things. We, we've been together on so many different occasions, but, but now what you're saying just doesn't seem to make sense. And we're left shaking our head going, what is, this, what is he even talking about? Where is this coming from? And, and there's no way that this could be true. It wasn't supposed to go down this way. In fact, it's so shocking, Jesus reminds them, has to remind them multiple times into the future. Time doesn't allow us to go into each one. You may want to jot down Matthew 17, verses 22 and 23, and, and Matthew 20, 17 through 19 to look up later. And this leads to Peter's uninformed response, our, our second point for the morning, in verses 22 and 23. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Oh, no, Lord, this can't happen to you. Jesus turned to Peter and told him, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me because you're not thinking about God's concerns, but, but human concerns. A.B. Bruce, the author of the classic book, The Training of the Twelve, describes it this way. Peter here appears in a new character. A minute ago, he is speaking under the inspiration from heaven, now under the inspiration of the opposite source. He goes on to say, none are more formidable instruments in temptation than well-meaning friends who care more for our comfort than our character. So in response, Jesus immediately jumps on this. Peter, Peter, you're a hindrance to me right now, actually. You're, you're literally a stumbling block to me. Jesus goes on and lets him know that he, he realizes that he's being tempted to forgo the way of the cross and, and to forgo the suffering that he is about to participate in. And what I really want you to hone in on here is, is how is this possible that Peter could clearly see that, that God is Jesus and, and Jesus is God in human form and yet miss what he came to do. I mean, how, how is one to go about that? And, and yet in our text, we, we see Jesus specifically saying how this is possible. He says that, that right now, Peter, you're, you're thinking more about human concerns versus God's concerns. There's other translations that say You know, you're not setting your mind on the things of God. Instead, you're setting your mind on things of man. Now, let's pull back from this ultimate unprecedented time to compare it to what we're living in right now. You know, what is one of the key ways, if not maybe the key way, that you or I could get off course and and go down unhealthy roads either already or in the days to come. I think we've seen in our text this morning, it's it's thinking too much about human concerns and not enough about God's concerns. You see, there's enough coverage of the coronavirus coming at us from so many different angles that that we we can spend 24-7 doing nothing but catching the latest update and, and hearing what other people are saying about it and what's happening around the globe to fight this battle together. Now, is it wise to stay informed? Absolutely. We need to stay up to date. We need to know what we should be doing to protect ourselves. But but how do we know when it's it's come to an unhealthy level? How do we know that we've just taken that too far where it it dominates our thoughts and it it just consumes us? It's hard to think about anything else. We get to the point where or it's as if we're tracking down every conspiracy theory behind it, or we're so gripped with an anxiety that, that it is tough to focus. We must be more intentional than maybe ever before to set our minds on the things of God so we're prepared to meet the concerns of human beings. Now, is this easy to do? Absolutely not. It will take ruthlessly carving out time to spend alone with the Lord in prayer and his word. 
And I'll be the first one to admit that this is easier said than done. You know, for example, I'm, I'm guessing that many of you have already experienced one of those moments. Maybe multiple moments already. A moment in time where you, you started to panic. Uh, you started to feel overwhelmed. You started to get to a point where there was just so much uncertainty about the future, you just became so unsettled. What has that moment been for you so far? You see, for me, it was last Thursday. I was up way before dawn, feeling as if I was behind on my sermon preparation, and, and then late that morning, I started hitting a wall. I had trouble putting thoughts together and, and what potentially the, the next point that the Lord wanted me to make. And, and I, I was shocked at how quickly I s- started spiraling downhill from there. And all of a sudden, I've got all these, these worst-case scenarios going through my mind. And, and dear God, this, this sermon's not going to come together. And, and this is going to be an absolute disaster. And, and if there was ever a time that God's people needed reassured from Him and His Word... It would be now, and yet all they're going to witness is a a train wreck happening right before their very eyes. And those thoughts kept just coming and coming and coming. To the point that I just had to step away and and, and go outside, and and I I ended up going for a run. And and it was a different run than I I normally go about. I I put the headphones away. I... There wasn't any podcast to listen to, and I, and I just tried to set out doing nothing but rememorizing Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. You see, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And I'll tell you, it it wasn't just once saying that. It was over and over, and, and it took a while to relax. And I got to the point that I started breaking that verse down into smaller bite sized chunks and and just repeating over and over again. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. And this comes with a significant promise. This peace, this peace will actually guard our heart and our mind in Christ Jesus. It will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. It will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. And eventually I started to relax. Relax heart stopped racing and and at that point I looked down at my phone and it was exactly 1156 and just as God had transformed my heart and mind through his word leave it to him to make it even that much more personal and reminding me yet again of his concern for for me and I know this might sound corny but This is one small but powerful way the Lord has reminded me repeatedly over the course of my life that he is there always. You see, way back in high school, I in baseball, my my baseball number was 11. In football, my number was 56. And somewhere along the line, I was led to put those two things together to represent a, a time of day. And I can't tell you how many times the Lord has used this in my life. I'll be going about a given day and, and busy with the task at hand, and, and all of a sudden I'll look down at my, my watch or my phone, and what do you know? It's exactly 11.56. It's as, it's as if the Lord is reminding me again. Now, I'm sure this sounds incredibly corny to a lot of people, and and. There's a part of me that's just a little surprised that I would share something that personal with so many different people. I'm sure my family is is wondering the same thing. I can't can't believe he's sharing this uh, online for all the world to see. But if you don't have something that 
that can draw you back to him on a regular basis. Maybe it is a time of day. Maybe it's something. I encourage you to do that so that he can remind you of his presence and that will be the case time and time and time again. As we move back to the scripture in in chapter 16, verse 24, we come to the third point, this this ultimate exchange. And we'll see how critical it is to be reminded in order to prepare for this verse. And according to Mark's version, he says that Jesus not only addresses the disciples, but he addresses the crowds as well. And he says if anyone wants to come after him, they're going to have to do three things. They're going to have to fall, or they're going to have to deny themselves... They're going to have to pick up their cross daily, and they're going to have to follow him. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as the law of discipleship, meaning in order to be a disciple or a follower of Jesus, we must realize that discipleship will come with a cost. Following him does not mean a person enjoys glory immediately. At times, it will require suffering. At times, it will require loss. And I realize this this might not be helping your fear and anxiety right at the moment, but hang in there. This is where we need to keep digging into God's word so that that he can provide a, a map for us and a way to navigate whatever he has in store for us into the future. So this first step is to, to deny oneself. What this means is to renounce our old way of life completely. Galatians 2.20 may be the clearest description of this. It says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Warren Wiersbe says, this about this particular aspect of denying ourselves. He said, denying self is not the same as self-denial. Listen closely here. This is, this is important. We practice self-denial when for a good purpose we occasionally give up things or activities. But we deny self when we surrender ourselves to Christ and determine to obey his will and his will alone. This is the first part of the ultimate exchange, deny self. The second part is to take up our cross daily. Here again, this takes some deconstructing as well because there can be a lot of confusion around this statement also. I mean, how how many of us have ever heard someone say something to the effect, "Well, well, that's just my cross to bear. And they could be referring to anything difficult in their life. That's my cross to bear dealing with this difficult person or this difficult situation or this difficult job that that I'm not really enjoying right now. However, the expression take up your cross refers to the cross that has suffered because of our union with Christ. Bearing a cross thus refers to being willing to endure anything that happens to us as a result of our association and our, our allegiance to following him, even if it brings about shame, even if it brings about suffering for his sake. And this is critical to grasp, grasp in order to move on to this third step, and that's as a result of picking up that cross, we're going to go ahead and follow him with it. This is where Peter's confession and our confession to trust and follow Jesus is put to the test. In order to follow him, we must examine ourselves and and evaluate if our decision for Christ or our acceptance from him, receiving him into our lives, translated into more than just that initial prayer we prayed or that, that initial commitment we made. Or those initial words we said, maybe, maybe years ago or maybe in the not too recent past. You see, it's easy to say we're for something or we endorse someone. It is quite another to take steps to deny ourselves as a result of that, to take up our cross daily and to follow them. Now once again, if we pull back and ask ourselves, 
Well, how does this help us navigate unprecedented times? Well, the way forward is obviously going to become more difficult. And we can choose to follow Christ as we move forward or potentially some other means. And committing now to exchange our ways for his ways will make all the difference in the world as the effects of the coronavirus are just beginning to be felt and there's, there's still so many unanswered questions that we have no idea how to anticipate what may come to us. You see, what does it look like to follow Jesus if we lose our job? What does it look like to follow Jesus if someone close to us becomes infected with the virus? What does it look like to follow Jesus if if we ourselves contract the virus? What does it look like to follow Jesus if if we don't experience personally anything significant, but, but we're surrounded by other people that have? Well, thankfully, Jesus doesn't leave his disciples or us in the dark, wondering if following him will be worth it in the end. Or could there be some some better way, some more appropriate way to move forward? Throughout the rest of the passage, he describes three unimaginable results. This is our, our fourth and final point of following him. Each Each result starts with the word for. Take a look at verse 25 for the first result. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. And here we see a powerful play on words as the same Greek word is used for the word life and soul. So in essence, what Jesus is posing here is the question, well, what, what is real life anyway? There are more important considerations than just merely our physical survival. In other words, if we put all our time and attention and, and resources into solely making our, our physical survival and, and retaining that and protecting yourself, if that's, that's all we're consumed by and focused on, Scripture says we'll actually lose our life and soul as a result. Andrew Murray refers to this as the self-life. He says, self is the very center of a created being. And why did God give human beings a self? The object of this self was that we might bring it as an empty vessel unto God that he might put into it his life. He goes on to say, God gave me a spirit of self-determination that I might bring this self every day to God and say, please work with it. I offer it to thee. You see, God wanted a vessel into which he might pour out his divine fullness of beauty and wisdom and power to display his glory through broken vessels. So that there could never be a question that when his light is shining through us that that there is no way that is us. And it could only be coming from him. Well, the second result is, is in verse 26. For what will it benefit someone if he gains the whole world yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? Well, one of the best commentaries for this is, is Psalm 49, 7 and 8. A couple of very clear verses that say, Abundant riches cannot redeem a person or pay his ransom to God. Next verse goes on to say the reason why. Since the price of redeeming him is too costly, one should forever stop trying. And the third result comes in the last two verses of our text. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and and then he will reward each according to what he has done. Truly, I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. 
You see, these results are unimaginable because Jesus closes things out by pointing to his second coming. And he promises to reward those who have trusted in him and followed him based upon what they've done for him. And then there's the final verse, which time doesn't allow us to get into fully, given all of the commentary from anywhere from four to six different options of what Jesus could be talking about. So I'll leave that for you to study on your own or with your group. So as we pull back one final time to gain perspective for today, and, and we ask this question, you know, what should we do in response, especially at this time? The first step in the map for navigating unprecedented times and, and really all other times we may encounter begins with this unprecedented question, who do you say Jesus is? As we saw in the text, there can be a great deal of confusion about this. Some might say that he's a great moral teacher. There's others that, that might say, you know, in my mind, it's really not even a relevant question anymore. You know, I'm doing okay on my own. There might be others of you out there that say that it's just too painful to go there because of what I've experienced in the past. However, no matter what your initial reaction is to that question, I pray and plead with you to fight through all of that and reconsider it again today. For there is only one man in all of human history who predicted this of himself and lived to tell about it that predicted that he would suffer many things, that were predicted that he would be killed, that predicted that he would be raised again three days later so that we, you and I, could be rescued from our sins, rescued from this world and all the pain and suffering and viruses that come with it. And not only that, that we would overcome death and have an opportunity to spend eternal life with him. So if the Lord is calling you to answer this question like Peter did, yes, I truly believe you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Please respond to him today and please let us know. Well, the second step is to think about God's concern. And the only way this is possible is to spend time with him. Spending time with him in, in prayer and in his word. You know, I wonder, I wonder if we would take some of the extra time that we might have right now. Not everybody, I'm sure, has afforded that at the moment. They could be working overtime and then some in, in critical missions they're about right now. But, but if, you're, if you've been afforded some extra time at home, I wonder what it would look like if, if you increased your, your frequency and, and quantity of your time with the Lord. And I'm just curious at, at what impact that might have on your, your direction ahead as you, as you pray for wisdom, as you pray for guidance, as you pray for direction. So that's step number two. Step number three is to deny yourself. And this is where true discipleship begins. You see, it's one thing to make a profession of faith. It is quite another to put that faith into action. So if you've never journeyed too far beyond saying you know who Jesus is, I can only imagine what awaits you as you commit to losing your life in order to receive it back and experience what he has for you as you follow him. Now I realize this, this step takes, takes even more faith and, and, it, and it comes with so many different questions and, and thankfully Jesus didn't leave us to figure it out on our own. He, in fact, he modeled what it looked like to follow him. You know, the majority of his time spent on earth was, was with just 12 disciples and then he pulls Peter, James and John even closer and, and they experience even more with him. So this is where I want to challenge all of our grow groups, all of our RD groups to continue meeting online for the foreseeable future. Now I recognize that that might not be possible for 100% of you. And if that's the case, please be at peace. But for as many that can, and I know that wrestling with technology might be the last thing on your mind right now, but, but trust me, it is worth it. You know, to be honest, I, I put all that off and, and I'd never even heard of the, the word Zoom or a Zoom video meeting, but, but after this week I became a quick believer in it. 
The first time I'd ever used it was Tuesday morning, early Tuesday morning for our RD group. Now, was it pleasant looking at those three other guys on video all wearing their baseball hats, working from home early in the morning? I'll, I'll be honest with you, it wasn't. It was, it was a horrible sight. You know, initially, I, I just had to look away a few times just to be able to focus on what was happening in the conversation. But by the end of our time together, there were four men who normally don't get very emotional, all recognizing how much seeing each other meant. Even right now as I talk about it, I still get goosebumps. You could, you could see in our eyes, that call meant a great deal. God did something among us. I have no idea exactly what, but it, could, it was tangible as we were able to see each other through this. So take my word for it. If I could figure out how to use Zoom or, or some other mechanism, anyone can. And, and make plans this week to join your group online. And we're here to help. If you have any questions or, or need anything to get you over that hurdle, let us know. And trust me, it will be worth it. Looking forward to doing the same thing with our grow group tonight. Well, the fourth step is to take up your cross daily. And now this is going to look different for all of us. Now one practical way, if you're uncertain what that might look like for you, is to build on what Pastor John challenged us to do last week in, in caring for our senior adults. And then as a staff, we talked this week on Zoom again, of course, and, and I have to say the, the side of our staff working from home really wasn't much prettier. You know, I'm sorry to say that and, and uh, apologize in advance that I just let that cat out of the bag. But, uh, but we made it through. It was okay. And as the more we talked about it, we began to envision what would Jersey look like if, if everyone who calls Jersey home was cared for throughout this pandemic. And so last week, I want to thank everyone that responded. That was the first step. This week, we took steps to email all of our group leaders an updated roster of their group and ask them to, to put together a plan to, to really care well for everyone in their group in the coming months. Now, next week, we have a different goal. And that's to put together a structure to care for everyone that is currently not connected or not in a group. And believe it or not, that is a few hundred people who are, who are really, their, their only connection to Jersey is, is through a worship service from time to time, through what we're doing right now and nothing beyond that. So if the Lord is leading you to commit to adopting five to ten households to call and to care for over the next few months, please contact us at email at jerseychurch.org. And with the stories already coming in, already this week hearing from multiple people that have uh, been laid off and lost their jobs or, or dealing with flooding issues because of all the rain. We really want to jump on this as quickly as possible. And so we'd love to hear from you even yet today so that we can jump on this right away. And lastly, the fifth and final step is to follow him wherever that may take you beyond the people of Jersey. Wherever that might take you in the, your community, wherever that might take you in your neighborhood, wherever it might take you within your, within your own house, your own apartment. And to give you a vision of what this could look like, I'm going to close with a quote from a book entitled The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark. Writing in the year 251 about an epidemic they faced, Dionysus, the bishop of Alexandria, at the time, shared this about the members of his church there. Christians greeted the epidemic as schooling and testing. Thus, at a time when all other faiths were called into question, Christianity offered comfort and an explanation of what to do. Even more important, Christian doctrine provided a prescription for action. That is, the Christian way appeared to work. So as we navigate these unprecedented times together, may we all show that the Christian way indeed works as we trust and follow him. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we 
We thank you for your word, especially in a time like this. We thank you for, for whatever you called to us to do as a result of your word. Lord, I pray that you would give me the, the faith to continue stepping out as you're laying it upon my heart to do. And Lord, for everyone that has listened to this, that, that you would give them the strength, that you would give them the provision, that you would give them everything that is needed to deny themselves, to take up your cross daily and to follow you. And Lord, we look forward to, to what that is going to do both within us and through us and around us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.